Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah. welcome back, everyone. Okay. So the last talk of this uh, morning session is uh, by Hans Ringstrom from KTH in Stockholm. Uh, and he will talk about a uh, quiescent regime for big bang formation. Okay, so let me start by thanking the organizers for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be back in Vienna. And it's also, of course, a great pleasure to be speaking at this conference in honor of Yvonne Chukebra, whose work has meant so much for all of us. So, <clears throat> so this talk is about Big Bang singularities. Yes, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's on. It is on, yeah. Okay, is it better like this? Okay, so this talk is about Big Bang singularities. And uh, what I'm going to say is joint work with uh, Hans Udo Gröninger and uh, Oliver Petersen. So we all know, uh, due to the singularity theorems of Penrose and, and Hawking, that singularities appear natural in general relativity. On the other hand, the singularity theorems don't say too much about their nature. Uh, so one, one sort of perspective or picture you come across <clears throat> and if you want to understand more the nature of the singularities is of course this this picture by Belinsky, Kalashnikov and Lifshitz <clears throat> and very roughly speaking in three plus one dimensions the idea is that there are some oscillations I will get into be a little bit more precise in a moment uh, so this would be what happens for three plus one vacuum for instance and in particular matter models but there are also some exceptions. So if you have higher dimension, special matter model symmetry, then you know the behavior might in some sense be convergent, right? And this is sort of quiescent behavior. And <clears throat> okay, so this is very roughly speaking the idea. I mean, there's lots more to it than that. Let me be a little bit more precise by what I mean by these oscillations and, and these this convergent behavior. So what I have in mind <clears throat> is is uh, a space-time with a crushing singularity. So there is a partial foliation of the space-time by space-like Cauchy hypersurfaces, the mean curvatures of which are diverging uniformly in some direction. And this direction, I will think of as, as a singularity. Okay. And now if you want to sort of extract some interesting asymptotic information, you have to somehow expansion normalize because otherwise you don't, I mean, the mean curvature is blowing up for instance. And one object which turns out to be of central importance is, is what I call the expansion normalized Weingart map. So if you look at the leaves of the foliation, you can look at the uh, second fundamental form, you erase one index, you get a one one tensor field on the leaves of the foliation. This is a Weingart map or shape operator. And, and this of course is blowing up in some sense. So you need to expansion normalize. And one natural way to do that is to divide by the mean curvature. So this, this object, Okay, this object, um, script K, so the, the Weingart map divided by the mean curvature look, along the leaves of the foliation, this, this will be central throughout this talk. Okay, and now, of course, the, this expansion on my Weingart map is symmetric with respect to the induced metric. So, so it has real eigenvalues, and these will also be important. So I denote them LA here. And I'm, most of the time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna order them in this way. And of course, due to the normalization, you see that the sum of the eigenvalues is one. So in, in three plus one dimensions, there are actually just two functions here. So, so one way to sort of summarize uh, the information about the eigenvalues is like this, is L plus and L minus. This contains all the information about the eigenvalues. And then this sort of oscillatory picture for BKL is that these eigenvalues, this L plus L minus, they should evolve according to a one-dimensional chaotic dynamical system, namely the specific chaotic dynamical system I've illustrated at the top, right? So, so the, the relevant system is, is just a map from the cir unit circle to itself. You take a point S in top right there on the unit circle. You take the close, closest corner of the triangle. You draw a straight line to S, and then you continue to the next intersection. That gives you the image of the map, right? So this is, this is then kappa of S. This is a 
this defines the Kastner map. So it's a map from the unit circle to itself, or BKL map, if you prefer. This is this is a chaotic dynamical system. And the idea of BKL is that you know the eigenvalues of the expansional mass drawing art map should evolve according to this map, right? That's sort of the idea. And <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot more to it than this. This is sort of the oscillatory picture. I'm I'm interested here in the in the quiescent setting, and at the very sort of weakest level, this means that these eigenvalues of the expansional mass Weingart map are actually converging. But this, as I said, I mean, in in three plus one vacuum, for instance, that doesn't typically happen. But and th there are some conditions. So if you if you now look at sort of you look at model solutions or you look at general solutions satisfying some natural a priori conditions. The, the conditions you end up with are the ones in the top right there. So the L, A are ordered. And if you want to get quiescence, in order for that to be consistent, you need to have this condition on the eigenvalues at home. So this, this condition occurs. And OK, yeah. And this, this condition occurs. And, and remember that the, the eigenvalues are, are ordered here, right? And in particular, in three plus one dimension, this condition is just that L1 is positive. So this means that the smallest eigenvalue of the expansional mass Weingart map has to be strictly positive. So it, you know, the Weingart map has to be positive definite. Right? So this is sort of, you, in this situation, you can hope to get sort of convergence of the eigenvalues <clears throat> uh, without any sort of symmetry assumptions or anything like that, right? So that's the idea. Uh, you can also get quiescent behavior and so convergence of this uh, eigenvalues when this condition is violated, but then, but then you have to impose a, a, di a different condition. And the condition is that these, if, well, say LA minus LB minus LC plus one is less than equal to zero. Well, then there's this gamma ABC that has to be zero or decaying. And what is this gamma ABC? Well, these are actually the structure coefficients associated with a suitably normalized eigenframe, again, of the expansion normalized Weingart map. So it's sort of funny that everything comes from the expansion normalized Weingart map, right? Okay, so this is this is sort of this sort of the, the idea. And so far, this is, in a sense, just geometry. Let's couple this to particular matter, matter models, these sorts of ideas. So let's start by, by looking at, at vacuum, right? So, so we have these conditions that I wrote pre previously. The sum of the LA is one. And also if you have sort of the quiescent situation, there should be, there's an asymptotic version of the Hamiltonian constraint. And the asymptotic version of the Hamiltonian constraint is one I wrote over here. So the sum of the LA squared is one. This is in vacuum. You expect this asymptotic version of the Hamiltonian constraint. So now you have three conditions, right? The sum of the LA is one. The sum of the LA squared is one. And then you have this condition at the top, top right. You have these three conditions. Now you can ask yourself the question, are these conditions consistent? They are not consistent in three plus one dimensions, nor in four, five, six plus one dimensions. They are consistent in 10 plus one dimensions, right? So in n plus one dimensions, they're consistent for n greater than equal to 10, but they are not consistent if n is less than equal to nine, right? So if you're naive about it, you would sort of hope for, well, if, you know, in you know, n plus one dimensions for n greater than equal to 10, you would sort of hope for quiescent behavior, but but you know, for n less than equal to nine, you would you would expect some sort of oscillation. But this this now changes radically if you if you add matter a particular types of matter. So so there's if you add a scalar field, for instance, then the asymptotic Hamiltonian constraint looks like this. And in this situation, there's no problem to get all the all the conditions to be consistent in any any dimension, right? So there you can get quiescent behavior in you know, n plus one dimensions n greater than equal to three is not a problem. Okay, so now, uh, so now um, what am I gonna, what matter field am I gonna look at here? So here I'm gonna focus on Einstein nonlinear scaled field equations. So it's just, yeah, the Einstein equations, G equals T, uh, where G is of course the Einstein tensor, T is the, is the Stress energy tensor associated with nonlinear scale field, and you have the equation for the nonlinear scale field. And okay, so you can ask the question: Why would I want to look at this? Well, okay, so in the early universe, I mean, you can use this sort of thing to model inflation. In the late universe, you can use it to model the accelerated expansion. So it's actually quite natural. 
There are lots of results for these types of matter models concerning future global nonlinear stability. So if you can prove, prove past global nonlinear stability, you get stability all the way from the Big Bang, you know, for the, for, for the future. Right? So it's a natural class of, of, of uh, equation. Uh, say again? V is the potential, and it's it's the smoothest function of the, from the real numbers to the real numbers. So it's, a, it, it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's, you know, it's a scalable function. Exactly. Okay, right. So okay, now I've been so far I've been fairly vague about quiescence, right? So I've just said you know the eigenvalues converge. That's sort of what I have in mind when I say quiescence. Right? Now I'm going to go to the opposite extreme and be extremely specific concerning what I hope for uh, concerning the asymptotics. And, and the most thing you could ever hope for the asymptotics is that you get in so detailed information concerning the asymptotics that the asymptotics actually uniquely determine the solution, right? So in some sense, data on the Big Bang, right? So let me, let me now sort of formulate what data on the Big Bang might be. So initial data on the Big Bang for me would be the following object. So it's sigma, the script H ring, which is a Riemannian metric, a script K ring, which is one one tensor field, and then is is this uh, phi naught ring and phi one ring. So this is sort of data on the singularity. These are smooth. Oh, so phi, phi phi zero ring and phi one ring are smooth functions on sigma, right? Okay, these have to satisfy certain conditions, and the conditions here is that the trace of script K ring is one, and that script K ring is symmetric with respect to script H ring. Then then there are these these two equations. So this is sort of like limits of expansion normalized versions of the Hamiltonian and the momentum constraints. That's what these two conditions are. And here I'm, I'm focusing on the sort of generic setting, namely that you have this, this nice condition on the, on the eigenvalues of the expansion normalized Weingart map. I mean, so, so, so script K ring should, should be sort of as a limit of the expansion normalized Weingart map. And these, these LK ring, these are the, eigenvalues of the limit of the expansion normalized Weingart map. You can also, yes. Well, I mean, so, so this, this, okay. So, so this, I mean, this is essentially, I mean, this fits with, for instance, if you take the, the, the results of Losh and Allen, right? I mean, where they put data on the singularity and that's in the case of Gaussian foliation. And then, then you have this sort of, sort of picture, right? Or the, the work of Thibault Damour and so on. And they, I mean, that's their notion of data on the singularity. I mean, they have, for them, data on the singularity is actually some sort of solution to some auxiliary um, equations on the space time where they've truncated the equation by dropping certain spatial derivatives, but they keep some also, right? So, I mean, certainly there, there is a relation to ABTD in this sense, right? Okay, uh, right. Um, you can also define data on the singularity in the sort of non-generic setting, meaning that this condition is not verified. But if you do that, you have to impose conditions on the structure coefficients associated with an eigenframe of the script K ring, right? So then you can do that. And there are important results by, by Greg and, and uh, Greg Fonodoulos uh, and, and uh, Jonathan Luke, and also by, by Paul Klinger somehow in that study. Right? Okay, so this is now data on the singularity. This is, of course, completely uninteresting unless I explain to you what is the relation between an actual solution and this data, right? So what would be this, the, the relation between these things, right? Okay, so, so let's, let's go back to the, the picture I had earlier. So we have this, this um, <clears throat> say that we have um, a crushing singularity, right? So we have partial foliation of the space-time and then <clears throat> my space like Cauchy hypersurfaces and the mean curvatures are diverging uniformly. And you think, of, so think of this, so I here, these are just regular initial data for the Einstein nonlinear scale, non scale of field equations. And in fact, you should think of it as a family of regular initial data for the Einstein nonlinear scale field equations, you know, in this crushing singularity. And you're sort of, you want to know what are the asymptotics as you go towards the Big Bang, right? Now, of course, the mean curvature is blowing up by, by sort of assumption. The, the, the sort of volume associated with H bar is sort of going to zero. The scale of field is blowing up. It's clear that we have to expansion normalize these objects if we want to get the meaningful limit, right? So then the question is just, how are we going to sort of expansion normalize these objects in order to get the meaningful limit? Right? Okay, so my suggestion for an expansion normalization is this one. So, 
So the, the script K bar, well, this is just the expansion of my Swingart map like before, right? So here sharp is just means that you raise, I mean, so K, K bar of X comma dot is of course a one form, right? And then you raise it, the sharp is just you raise it with H bar, right? I mean, so from a one form to a vector field, right? So this 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 script K bar is is of course, but this is just the expansion of my Swingart map. The, the perhaps most interesting suggestion here is this script H bar, right? But the thing is that what happens as you go towards the singularity? But the thing is that the singularities will typically be anisotropic, right? So you will have expansion. You can even have, you'll have contraction in, at different rates in different directions. You can even have expansion, right, in some directions as you go in towards the singularity. And if you want to get the meaningful limit, you have to compensate for this somehow, right? And, and the thing is that the mean curvature is sort of, well, this is the philosophy here. The mean curvature is the overall parameter controlling sort of everything. But then, of course, you get different expansion, contraction, different directions. But that's determined by the expansion of my Weingart map, right? So the script K bar is determining the, the rate at which you're expanding, contracting, right? And, and the directions. So, so that's why I'm introducing the script H bar. So, so what is this theta bar raised to script K bar? Well, it's it's just what what it says, right? I mean, script K bar is an endomorphism of the tangent space, right? And, and theta bar is a strictly positive function. You can certainly raise a strictly positive function by an endomorphism. This perfectly fine, smooth endomorphism of the tangent space, right? I mean, you just you just write it e raised to log theta bar script K bar and then write down the standard, you know, formula for the exponential, right? And that that converges perfectly nicely, right? So so this is this is a perfectly fine uh, expression, this script uh, H bar, and it's going to sort of compensate for the expansion and contraction, right? And then we have we have to turn to the scalar field. Well, okay, so what is this little phi one bar? Well, the little phi one bar, that's just the normal derivative of the scalar field initially, right? And that's going to blow up typically in the direction of the singularity. So you have to expansion normalize. And my suggestion is we just divide by the mean curvature squared. Right? Then you have, then the scalar field itself is also. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the H, well, certainly it's a metric. Yeah. So it's not a okay, let me, okay, maybe, maybe I'm going to show you an example after this. And then, then maybe maybe it becomes clear. Uh, I mean, of course, if you have, I mean, if you write down everything in terms of an eigenframe of the expansional mice Weingarten map, you do, you see what it happens. I mean, then then you get you get. Uh, I mean, you exponenti exponentiate only the so the eigen values of the expansional mice Weingarten map, there, right? I mean, times the frame. So so you yeah. But anyway, um, okay, so then the last thing is that, of course, the scalar field is also going to blow up in the direction of the singularity, but this particular uh, combination, capital phi naught bar, this you expect to actually converge, right? So, so you see that if, if you give me these data, this regular data with theta bar positive, I will give you these expansion normalized initial data, right? And now what is the relation between this and asymptotic data? Well, the hope is simply that the script K bar should converge to this script K ring, you know, script H bar should convert to the script H ring, and so on and so forth, right? So, I mean, again, I mean, I'm looking at a, a crushing singularity, so I have this foliation, I'm looking at a family of initial data, so I'm looking at a family of expansion on last initial data, and this family should converge then, right? As you go towards the singularity. This is this is the idea. Okay, so let's, let's, let's calculate this for, for, for a simple special case, to see what happens, right? So one simple special case is when you take, so let's take spatially homogeneous and spatially flat solutions to the Einstein scalar field equation. So these are, well, these are in some sense, all of them. And so, so the metric looks like this. So the PIs are constants, A and B are constants, right? So if you define M like this, MG phi is a solution to the Einstein scalar field equations, as long as these, these conditions are satisfied. So some of the PI is one, some of the PI squared plus A squared is one. Right? Okay, so what, what happens if we would apply this sort of <laughs> recipe now to these data? I mean, so for, for each, each constant T, we get initial data. What happens then? So we get initial data on T cross Tn. You calculate what is script K bar? Well, it's just PI. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, they're all constant, right? 
in this case, right? So script eight bar is just a standard Euclidean metric, phi one bar is AM. I mean, sort of, so, so I mean, in this, in this particular case, I mean, of course, everything is constant. You get a nice limit. The limit is going to satisfy, they're going to be data on the singularity. This is, of course, a very simple case, right? But yeah, okay, good. So, so now I'm approaching the end of the introduction. Um, yes. Well, no, no, I mean, so now I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm focused, this is the quiescent setting, this is the quiescent setting. I mean, I mean, of course, of course, yeah, no, I mean, no, I mean, your, 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 your hope is that things will converge, right? I mean, that's a, yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah, that's, that's the hope. I mean, of course, then maybe life is more complicated, but yeah, and there are certainly plenty of examples where everything works out, right? But I mean, what actually happens in general, you know, I'm, okay, fine. So, so this, this is sort of a, one way of viewing these quiescent singularities. Okay, let me let me um, let me finish now the introduction, so I can get on with the talk, so to speak. So let me finish the introduction by mentioning some previous results. Right. So in the quiescent setting, there are lots and lots of results in in, in situations with symmetry, and this, from my point of view, is very nice. I'm really partial to these results because you can get conclusions for generic initial data, you know, sort of not not being close to to any particular background solution. You can see unexpected dynamics. I'm not going to say anything, though. I'm not going to say here anything about results in the cases of, with symmetry. There are lots of important results. Uh, you know, when you study, I mean, some numerical simulations. I'm not going to say anything about that either. I'm going to focus only on mathematical results in the absence of symmetries here. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something here, and I'm, I apologize beforehand. But but okay. So so if you look at results in the absence of symmetries, they sort of come in two flavors. There's there are some results where you put data on the singularity, and there are other results where you go towards the singularity. So uh, one very important result when you start on the singularity is the result by Losch and the um, and by Alan Rendell from 2001. So they studied the Einstein scale of field equations, and they studied also the Einstein uh, stiff fluid equations in three plus one dimensions and, and in the real analytic setting. And they were putting data on the singularity and proving that there are solutions converging towards them. And this is now, they were constructing Gaussian foliation. So this is a very nice result. And they cover the, you know, the complete generic regime, so to speak, when as long as the sort of limit of the expansion normalized Weingart map is positive definite, everything works out, right? So they, they cover the full regime you expect. Later on, there was a result by Thibaut Damour and collaborators, and this was sort of generalizing this work to higher dimensions, more general uh, matter fields. Also an important result, this is in the, in the in the real analytic setting, again, higher dimensions. A little bit later, there are important results by Paul Klinger on the one hand. This is in the real analytic vacuum setting and by Greg for Nodavlos and Jonathan Luke in the smooth vacuum setting. So again, these are results in the absence of symmetries and you get quiescent behavior. But as I said, you cannot have this generic condition satisfied here. So you have to put these sort of, you know, these, these structure coefficients associated with the asymptotic expansion normalized Weingart map, you have to put these structure coefficients to zero. But if you do that, sort of you, you, you also get quiescent behavior in this setting. But these are these are some very important results in, in uh, where you put data on the singularity. Now let's now there is also a lot lots of results proving stable Big Bang formation. This is rather recent. So the first result was due to to Igor Rodniansky and Jared Speck. So they were considering the k equals zero FLRW situation. And they were proving sort of stable Big Bang formation. Uh, then, then Jared Speck, he, uh, he proved stability in the case of k equals plus one, um, so FLRW. And so here you have a Big Bang and a Big Crunch. And, and he was proving sort of you get, you get stability all the way from the Big Bang to Big Crunch. Uh, then, then there's a result by Florian Bayer and Todd Olinik. This is again the k equals zero FLRW situation. But in this case, and uh, they actually use a completely different gauge where you can localize things. So most of these results, except the ones by Todd and Florian, they are with CMC foliation. So you sort of, it's a non-local gauge, but, but the sort of causal structure is local here. So in some sense, it would be nice to have a gauge which localizes, which sort of corresponds to the actual physics in a sense, right? So they, they do that, but they sort of revisit the result of, of uh, Igor and Jared. 
Then there's an important result by, by David Feynman and, and VM Urban. Um, so, so they, they considered K equals minus one FLRW situation. But what's, uh, one thing that's very interesting with this result is that not only do they prove sort of stable Big Bang formation, they also go to the infinite future. So this is, this is well, as far as I know, the first result where you really go all the way from the Big Bang to, to the infinite future, right? So this is a very nice result. And then there, there's a result by Florian Bayer and, and Todd Olenek where they consider not only a scalar field, but also a, a, a fluid and, and prove that for certain equations of state, the fluid just doesn't matter in the direction of the simulator. But these, these are sort of in the isotropic situation or closed isotropy. Then, then Igor and Jared, they, they sort of generalize this to situations where you have sort of intermediate anisotropy. So you have some significant anisotropy, but it's not the full sort of generic range. But finally, and then the most, most important result for this talk is, is this recent uh, result by Greg, uh, Igor, and Jared, right? So they prove stable Big Bang formation. And so for, so actually, I mean, well, they prove many things, but, but perhaps the main, main conclusion uh, is that if you look at these solutions, so spatially homogeneous and spatially flat solutions, they are all stable as long as this sort of generic condition is satisfied on the PI. So the PI satisfy the condition they should uh, on the, uh, and then all of those solutions are, are, are stable. And this is sort of the, as large uh, a regime as you can hope to get stability, right? So this is very important, this result for that reason, but it's also very uh, important because there is a ve very significant methodological overlap between this paper and our paper. So there's sort of, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, right. I mean, so 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 their ideas are very important for what we want to do. Okay, but but now, right? But now, so what is our goal? So our goal is actually to prove or to derive a condition on initial data that yields Big Bang formation, but without any reference to a background solution. So we somehow want to do something different than this. We don't want to prove stability of a specific background solution. We want to come up with a conditional initial data that guarantees big bang formation and curvature blow up, right? So that's what we want to do. And that's what I'm going to describe now. So this is the result now by, so this is again, joint work with uh, Hans Rudolf Schreininger and, uh, uh, and Oliver Pieterson, right? So this is the, the, the joint work I want. So as I said, I'm interested in the Einstein nonlinear scale field equations and I can't manage just arbitrary potentials. I need to impose some conditions on the potentials. And, and so in particular, well, I want the potentials to be non-negative. This isn't really absolutely necessary, but I'm, I'm gonna impose that here. Uh, but, and I also, I don't want them to grow too quickly at infinity. So if, if they go to grow too quickly at infinity, I have a problem. And more specifically, they shouldn't grow faster than E raised to two absolute value X. Yeah, right, and in fact, I even want the little margin that it it grows like you know e raised to two one minus sigma v. So sigma v turns out to be important. This you should think of this as a small real number sigma v, and and when sigma v goes to zero, you go to the boundary of the potentials you can deal with. So that's bad somehow when sigma v goes to zero, and the two there you can ask, okay, what's the two? Actually, the two is is a dimensionally dependent constant. And, but, but this dimensionally dependent constant converges to two as the spatial dimension converges to infinity, tends to infinity. So if you want to have the same number for all dimensions, it's two, right? But if you're interested in three plus one dimensions specifically, then you can put square root of six there if you prefer, that's fine. Yeah. But, uh, but okay, right. Um, so that's what I want for the potential. Okay, and then I'm now going to be interested in, I'm going to be interested in initial data for the Einstein nonlinear scale field equations. And I'm going to be interested in CMC initial data. So I'm going to insist on CMC. And then of course, as I explained before, you get this associated expansion normalized initial data with this. And I, of course I want this generic condition here, right? I want the condition that you know, the eigenvalue satisfy this and with some margin. So I'm fixing some sigma p here. This is a small real number. And I'm insisting that, that this sort of you know, generic type condition holds with the margin. And you see that again, sigma p going to zero is bad, right? Because then, then you're, you're getting to the border of what you can manage, right? 
So, so from this slide, what I want you to remember is sigma v and sigma p, because these are the margins to bad behavior, in a sense, right? Okay. Right, then here I'm going, in the statement of the main theorem, I'm going to assume that you have some sort of non-degeneracy, that the eigenvalues of the expansional much Weingarten map are distinct. This turns out not to be completely necessary for some of the conclusions, but, and I will get back to that in a moment, but I'm gonna assume here, at least in the statement of the main theorem, I'm going to assume that these eigenvalues are distinct. And this means, of course, uh, that there is a finite covering space of your initial manifold, which is um, parallelizable, actually. So that follows from this. And, and so, so I'm actually, you know, I'm going to assume that sigma is parallelizable, actually. And, uh, of course, in three plus one dimensions, this isn't a big assumption, right? I mean, so closed-oriented closed three-manifolds are, of course, parallelizable, right? So that's not, that's not a, a big assumption. So here, sigma will be closed and parallelizable. I'm going to make this assumption. Now, in the end, I'm also, I also need to impose some bounds on, uh, of, course, of course, the initial data, some, some Sobolev bounds on the initial data. And, and then there's some degree, Sobolev degree of regularity I'm going to impose. So, so I need to specify that. And OK, this is perhaps not so pleasant to look at. but. So, so first you specify the sigma, and sigma is sort of, again, it's a measure of the distance to the boundary of what you can manage, the bad potentials and sort of that you're not in the generic condition concerning the eigenvalues. So sigma measures that. And then I'm gonna fix two regularity degrees, K0 and K1. And the only thing I want you to remember from this is that I'm dividing by sigma, right? So sigma is this margin to bad behavior for, for the requirement for K1 is that I'm, I'm dividing here by sigma, meaning that as you go to the boundary of bad potentials and sort of this generic condition, the number of derivatives you need to control goes to infinity, right? So, so that's, that's, that's not so nice. Okay, so then, okay, so then these are sort of assumptions. So what are now the conclusions? What are the conclusions here? Okay, so, so the, the conclusions are the following, that if you give me a theta zero, and, and theta zero, you should think of here as a big number. This is a big number. What I will give you then is theta one, which is also a big number, right? And theta one will depend on theta zero, but it's also gonna depend on the other constants I mentioned earlier. So sigma p, sigma v, and so on, right? Such that if this bound holds, so this, this, the norms of these quantities are bounded by theta zero, and if you have this lower bound on the distance between the eigenvalues, then the maximal global hyperbolic development associated with uh, the data are going to yield a big bang with curvature blow up and, and sort of crushing CMC foliation. But okay, so, so this, this condition here probably looks rather funny uh, if, if you haven't seen it before. Maybe it looks funny even if you would have seen it before. But, but okay, so, so, so what is the logic here? It's a little bit funny logic, right? The point here is, we, let, let's go back to what I told you about expansion normalized data and limits of this expansion normalized data, right? So if you have this crushing singularity and you have this idea that the family of expansion normalized initial data converges to the limit, let's say that we are in this situation. In that situation, you, you should think of this script H bar and script K bar and so on. This is a family of expansion normalized data. And in, in the good situation, this is converging to a limit, right? As the mean curvature blows up, right? So this means that if you look at if you look at the left hand side, this is uniformly bounded in the direction of the singularity at the same time as the mean curvature is blowing up, right? So it's rather natural to first impose a bound on on these expansion normalized quantities. You first impose a bound on these expansion normalized quantities, then you crank up the mean curvature, so to speak. That's perfectly fine. This is sort of you you expect this to be perfectly fine if you if you would have convergence, right? So in that sense, this is quite natural. Of course, if you take like if you take the special case of the spatially homogeneous and isotropic solutions, the left-hand side is you know independent of the mean curvature, right? It's constant, right? And then certainly cranking up the mean curvature is not a problem, right? But but I want to emphasize that this is now a condition which does not refer to any background solution whatsoever, right? This is a general condition on initial data, and if this condition is satisfied you're gonna get a big bang with curvature blow, right? 
So this is what I want to emphasize. So what are the conclusions? So first, if you look now at the maximal global hyperbolic development of this initial data, the causal past of the initial hypersurface will have a crushing CMC foliation. So there will be a CMC foliation in the causal past, and this will be crushing, so the mean curvatures will, will diverge to infinity. So that's the first thing you get. The eigenvalues, so if you look at the eigenvalues of the expansion normalized Weingart maps on the leaves of these foliations, the eigenvalues are going to converge to some limits, this LA ring, right, in some space, so this CK0 plus 1. Uh, also, if you look at sort of like the expansion normalized versions of the scalar field, so phi one is defined just as, okay, so U is, of course, the future directed unit normal on the leaves of the CMC foliation. And you, so U phi is what was phi one bar before, right? So that's one part of the data for the Einstein nonlinear scale field equations, right? And so, and you expansion normalized by dividing by the mean curvature, just like before. And this phi one is going to converge to phi one ring to a limit. And then this phi zero is defined just like in analogy with the phi zero uh, bar before. And that's also going to converge to a limit. So that's that's sort of everything is is looking uh, looking nicely there. And then you also get sort of the limit of the Hamiltonian constraint. So the sum of the L Li ring squared plus phi one squared. This is one. So this is like the limit of an expansion normalized version of the of the Hamiltonian constraint that's going to be satisfied. Of course, the sum of the Li ring is going to be one, of course. But then, and then you, of course, you get the generic condition in the limit as well. But perhaps more important is, is, is if you take now the, the space time Ricci tensor contracted with itself is going to blow up in the direction of the singularity. If you take the space time Riemann tensor contracted with itself, it's going to blow up in the direction of the singularity, right? And then also, I mean, you get all causal geodesics are, you know, are incomplete to the past. And let me point out, I mean, since I have a potential here, the conditions of Hawking's theorem are not necessarily satisfied, right? I mean, so you don't necessarily have the time-like convergence condition in the setting, right? But nevertheless, I mean, all the, all the causal geodesics are incomplete to the past. Okay, so this is, this is the result. And again, I mean, this is joint work with Hans Ude Groeninger and, and uh, Oliver Pietersen. Okay, so let me make let me make a few remarks here. So, so the very 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 roughly speaking, the proof is divided into two steps. There are two there are two parts. So we have a fundamental problem in that we don't have a background solution to prove the stability of. That's bad. And and what do we do to remedy that? We construct something we call a scaffold. From the initial data, we construct something we call a scaffold, which will effectively serve the purpose. Of a background solution, right? And then, and then we use a bootstrap argument, sort of keeping track of the distance between the actual solution and the scaffold. Right? So that's sort of the idea. And and this condition of non-degeneracy, we needed it to construct a scaffold. But I mean, if you give me a specific background solution, then I don't need. Then if you give me a background solution that can serve as a scaffold, and and then I don't need the non-degeneracy, right? So I can if if. If, if you want me to, to study the stability of a specific solution, I don't need to assume non-degeneracy I mean, or th that the eigenvalues of the initial expansion on West Weingarten map are distinct. Right? Okay, so, so let me just, just, just compare them. So you have this, so one of the consequences then is that, I mean, one of the corollaries of this, of this result is that in particular, we get and um, past global nonlinear stability, also, I mean, of this generalized Kastner solution. So if you take the spatially homogeneous and spatially flat solutions to the Einstein scalar field equations, right, and satisfying these generic conditions, this is stable. This was already proved by Greg, Igor, and Jared, but this also follows as, as a conclusion of our, of our uh, result. Uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier that Jared Speck, he proved stability in the K equals plus one, um, FLRW situation for the Einstein scalar field equations. In our case, one corollary of our result is that if you take any Bianchi type 9 solution with a non trivial scalar field, then this is going to be stable to the future in the past, right? So, Jared's result is, is in the case of an isotropic Bianchi 9 solution, but we get it for all Bianchi 9 solutions. They're all stable, both to the future and the past. And um, then you have, there's a result by, by David Feynman and, and Liam Urban in the, in the K equals minus one FLRW situation. Again, this, this sort of follows, but we do not, I mean, let, let me again emphasize, I mean, they also get 
future global nonlinear stability in the Einstein scalar field setting. This we do not get. We only study the you know, direction of the singularity. And, and um, on the other hand, we do get future global nonlinear stability in the setting if you have a nonlinear scalar field. And then you also get future for appropriate assumptions concerning the potential. Okay, I don't know. I don't know how I'm doing with time. Maybe I should stop here at some point. Uh, I have a little bit more time. What? 15, really? Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. Good. Um, right. And, and another sort of, another consequence, yes? Yeah. I do not. And this is extremely important. So, so I'm in some sense, it is disappointing, the whole thing, right? I'm going to get back to that in a moment. I don't get the complete asymptotics that I would like to get, right? So in that sense, you know, the result does have some serious deficiencies, right? I mean, it's nice to get clever to blow up, but I mean, in the end, you would really like to get the full data on the singularity, but I do not, we do not get that, right? So, no. Thanks. I mean, that's a very, very important point. Right? <clears throat> okay. Uh, right. So let me, right. So, so let me then uh, mention some other consequences. So, I mean, if you actually say that you have data on the singularity and you have a solution with a CMC foliation, where sort of the <clears throat> converging to this data on the singularity, well, then that will also be stable, right? In our setting, because this is, this just fits perfectly with our setup, right? So any, any such solution arising from data on the singularity, and it's also with, you know, like the CMC foliation, that's automatically going to be stable also, right? Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, yeah, exactly. So, if, yeah, if you, if you have... Hmm? So... Yeah, yeah, they would also, they would also be stable. I mean, in, in the sense that, in the sense that the theorem applies, but of course, I, I, as, as, as was pointed out, uh, when I perturb, I don't know that I, again, get data on the singularity, so to speak, right? I mean, that would, that, that would be the nice result. I mean, you start with data on singularity, you have a corresponding solution, you perturb that, and then you want to get not only stability, but you want to get back to data on the singularity, right? I mean, this is, this is what you would like, but we're not there yet, right? I mean, but that would, that, that would be very nice to, to prove, right? That's uh... okay. And then, I mean, you actually get, you get, past and future global nonlinear stability for large classes of spatially homogeneous, spatially locally homogeneous and spatially compact solutions. So I, I mean, there are lots of corollaries here. I'm not gonna, I, I can't, I, you know, but I, I, I've just selected two examples. I already told you Bianchi nine, Einstein scalar field, this is stable to the future and the past. Another, it's just an example. So if you take spatially locally homogeneous, spatially compact Bianchi type eight solutions with an exponential potential, well then this is also gonna be stable, you know, both, the Big Bang and, and to the infinite future, right? Any any such solution. So there are lots lots of sort of stability results that follow from that. Okay, um, okay. So okay, so then I have some time to say something about the the uh, about the the proof. I mean, very very briefly. So so as I told you, I mean, one fundamental problem we have is this that we don't have a background solution, right? And, and most of the time, you, you want to prove some sort of bootstrap argument where you prove that you stay close to some sort of background solution, right? So this is a fundamental problem. How do you get around that here? Well, the idea is to construct this sort of scaffold, which will be a substitute for background solution. So how are you going to construct this scaffold? Well, from what I've already explained, I mean, in some sense, it's quite natural, right? What do we expect? Well, we expect that this expansion normalized initial data should converge, right? So that's what we expect. We expect the expansion normalized initial data to converge. So the most naive thing you could possibly do is you take the expansion normalized initial data on the initial hypersurface and you postulate this has to re remain constant, right? We, we take the expansion normalized initial data on the initial hypersurface and now we postulate this has to remain constant. This defines the scaffold, actually, right? So, so, so here I've, I've I've written now, so E0 check and EI check, this is a, a frame on the manifold. And the requirement that this is an orthonormal frame 
this defines the scaffold metric, let's say. So E0 check is just, just D, D by DT. And I should say, so what is T here? What's the time coordinate? You should, you should compare with the actual solution. And for the actual solution, you choose a time coordinate, which is one over the mean curvature. So T0 is one over the initial mean curvature. And then in the CMC foliation you're constructing, T is one over the mean curvature of the leaf with which you're comparing, right? What is Li bar? Well, Li bar, these are the eigenvalues of the initial expansional nice Weingart map. That's what they are. And the Ei bar is the corresponding eigenvector field of the expansion, initial expansional nice Weingart map, right? But it's also the Ei bar is also an orthonormal frame with respect to the initial metric, right? So Ei bar is an ortho orthonormal eigenframe of the expansional nice Weingart map of the initial hypersurface, right? And so, so this naturally now defines, this naturally defines uh, global frame and, and this frame defines uh, the scaffold metric. And then this, this requirements that the expansion normalized sort of versions of the scalar field that they remain constant, this defines the scaffold scalar field. So now we have a scaffold metric, we have a scaffold scalar field. And we have something with which to compare. Of course, the problem here is that these objects will certainly not be solutions to Einstein's equations, right? So that's unfortunate, right? They're not going to be spatially homogeneous. I mean, because, because you know, as I said, the, the, the you now so the spatial derivatives of the eigenvalues here could be arbitrarily large. There is no smallness assumption on those, right? They could be, the spatial derivatives could be arbitrarily large. You have a, if you have a spatially homogeneous solution, and of course the eigenvalues of the expansion on the Weingart map are gonna be constant. But here the derivatives could be arbitrarily large. There is no bound on that, right? Okay. And then, okay, then what we do. So now, I mean, so now we read, we, we read the classics from, from this year. So by Greg, Igor, and Jared, right? And, and what we conclude is that, well, it's, it's convenient to use the CMC foliation, vanishing shift, and Fermi Walker propagated frame. So this is, we use actually, I mean, the natural generalizations of the equations used by Greg, Igor, and Jared to this setting, right? Okay, they looked at the torus and they looked at, you know, they have spatially homogeneous background solution, but, but the equations, you can, you can naturally generalize them to the setting, right? That's, that's perfectly fine. And then we use a bootstrap argument, much much the way they do. Of course, there are differences, right? I mean, there, I mean, there, 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 there's substantial overlap, but there are also some substantial differences, but I mean, their, their work is very important. Uh, and then, and well, okay, <laughs> then you prove past global nonlinear stability. I, okay, I, now, now I'm sort of running out of time. I can't go into too many details here, right? But uh, let me perhaps mention, mention some, some differences. Okay, so of course, it, it is a complication that the scaffold is neither a solution nor spatially homogeneous. That's certainly a problem. Just um, let me just take one, one sort of technical issue as an example of what, what, have, what, what comes up. So. For instance, when, when you do the bootstrap argument at some point, I mean, as in talk we saw right now, I mean, you, at some point you need to, to commute, of course, with spatial derivative equations, with spatial derivatives. And at some point you need to commute then spatial derivatives with this type of operator. If, if the Li bars are just constants, commuting this with spatial derivatives, this is perfectly fine. If you commute it with, uh, if in our situation, the, the Li bar are not constants, the derivatives can be arbitrarily large. So when you commute, you're going to get one over t terms. But this turns out to be bad, right? I mean, so so if you have things that blow up in the direction of the singularity, like t raised to minus one plus epsilon, then you're happy. This is nice. But when things blow up like one over t, you're unhappy, right? There's a problem. So there's sort of there are some issues you need to deal with, right? But I mean, in the end, in the end, you can deal with it. There are, of course, more more sort of complications, you know, sort of in terms of just lengths of the arguments and things you need to estimate because, and, and of course, the potential does make a substantial difference in a sense, right? Um, so the potential, this causes problems. It's a parallelizable manifold, not the n tours. It's a frame. It's not a coordinate frame. So it, things swell out. But 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 the idea, of what what we're do, we're trying to do here in this paper, or what we're doing in this paper, we derive an algorithm. For estimating terms, so in order to streamline the argument, so so actually the, the length of the argument is actually not so much, it's not so much longer actually. So that I mean the paper is less than eighty pages. It's a short paper, right? I mean this is <clears throat> uh, okay, fine. And then then we come to to outlook, and now we come back to your question. 
in some sense, all the results on stable Big Bang formation are this, uh, including ours, in some res respects, they're all fundamentally disappointing, right? And why are they fundamentally disappointing? Well, you really want to get back to data on the singularity, right? I mean, you want to prove at the end of the day, you want to have detailed enough information concerning the asymptotics that you can extract data on the singularity. And none of the results so far do that. I mean, they, they I mean, in some sense that the, the leading order part of, of the behavior is really the expansion of the Weingarten map and, and also the normal derivative of the scalar field. These are the most important objects in a sense that is sort of driving the evolution. But in the end, you really want to get more detailed information. And that, that, that is, is, we haven't managed yet. And then, and then there's the issue of, of localization. I mean, our gauge as well is, is sort of, it's a non-local gauge. In the end, I mean, you know, with, with, the, with the actual physics in mind that things actually do localize as you go towards the singularity, there are particle horizons, you would really like to, to be able to localize. And that's, okay, that's, uh, there is a result by, by, by Florian and Todd, which is very nice, but it's, it's close to the spatially homogeneous and isotropic setting. And it's also, um, and they also don't get the asymptotics you want to get, right? So, so that's there's more, there's lots of work to be done here, and 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 with that, maybe I end and thank you for your attention.